Uh, so next up, we have uh, Vladimir, Managing Security and Authorization in GraphQL. This should be a really good talk. Uh, Vladimir has been around the block a lot when it comes to these kind of topics. Uh, working at Screen, uh, core contributor to Node.js. I mean, he knows he knows some stuff. So uh, I'm not going to take any more of his time. Please uh, give us give us your goods. Thanks a lot for the intro. I will try to uh, be as good as you depicted me. Um, so this should share my screen. Is that correct? I hope so. Let me just do two seconds of window management. I apologize immediately, but I will be looking at this screen because I've got like a dual thing and uh, the webcam is obviously not where it should be. Um, so let's go for this talk about um, GraphQL with a security perspective. Um, as introduced, I'm Vladimir de Turkheim. I work at Screen uh, where I do Node security full-time and I'm also part of the Node.js security team. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter if you want. And I have a confession to make. I'm not a GraphQL expert. Um, my field of expertise is web application security. And I actually do two things in my life. I protect applications and I break applications. And from time to time, I also build things. And uh, what I want to bring to this talk is the perspective from someone who is at the same time a developer, but also a security person through GraphQL. So in this whole talk, we will consider that GraphQL is another way to exchange data between a client and a server. And we will see what will be the perspective of a hacker when meeting GraphQL. So GraphQL is an abstraction and it's designed to make your life better. It enables you to build better application faster. And the first time I discovered GraphQL, I was just feeling like a, like a turtle on a rocket. It just like feels the future and so powerful. But abstractions sometimes can make you forget about implementation details. And as a hacker, as a security person, the most important at the end of the day is implementation details. That's where the fun happens. And probably I'm going too fast and I'm spoiling the major part of my talk. So let's dig into one question is, who would one attack a GraphQL app? Um, I don't plan in giving you tools to be to destroy applications that are presented in, to, in this conference, but I want to give you the perspective of the process uh, of who a hacker malicious or not malicious would go to break a GraphQL application. And without any surprise, I guess the first thing a hacker should do is to identify that the application is actually using GraphQL because otherwise there is no need into knowing anything about GraphQL hacking if you want to break into REST or other kind of APIs. So, okay, it's pretty easy. Uh, have you heard of this tool named Wapalizer? It's basically an add-on you can add to Chrome and I recommend actually everyone who is interested in tech to have this add-on. And it tells you which are the libraries used by your website. And here I was browsing Airbnb sooner today and I see they have Apollo somewhere. So I can expect them to use GraphQL somewhere. Of course, GraphQL is not only used for a browser-facing application, it can be used for mobile application, but we have a set of tools to analyze either the application code, if it's a mobile application, either the application network traffic, and that's pretty much how we detect that an application is using GraphQL. We will find GraphQL-related libraries, we will find post requests to a slash GraphQL endpoint, or we will inspect the payloads and just see that they look like GraphQL. It's the uh, hacker spirit. You have to know enough little things about a lot of things so you can identify things. And I said a lot of times the word things in that last thing. What comes next? You have identified that an application is using GraphQL. So yeah, hacker, 
what do you do next? Then you want to identify the schema of the GraphQL application. I will explain right after why it's one of the first thing you want to do, but we will use two techniques to identify the schema of a GraphQL application. The first one is abusing introspection. So GraphQL is very powerful and self-documenting and a simple query could actually be used to identify the schema of a GraphQL application, depending on the implementation of the GraphQL server. So let's do a live demo because we are ambitious and mostly because we are not on a stage at a physical conference, but I am in the comfort of my home with my optic fiber conference uh, internet. So I hope that my, uh, that my live demo will work. So here I've got just a simple GraphQL endpoint. It enables me to track some kind of Dropbox-like application. When I've got users, I can fetch them by ID and I can get their name and I can identify the amount of disk usage. Uh, let's say that I want to check the billing and I've got these pieces of information. And because I have prepared my talk, I've got a query in my history that is named introspection query. And to be honest, uh, that's why I circle back and not being a GraphQL expert. What a hacker will do, they will identify that your app uses GraphQL and they will Google how to hack GraphQL applications and they will see you should drop the schema. So they will Google how to drop the schema and they will find this query online. I did not write this query. I just copy pasted it from somewhere on GitHub and it works. You actually have knowledge about the query and you can drop the schema itself. You even have the documentation. So I told you about users in this app I built. Here you've got uh, the description of the query with the parameters so you know what query are valid. And then later you've got the uh, type of the user uh, where you can identify that's not what I want. I want the type of the user, it should be inside. Where is it? Okay, that's the demo epic fail. Here it is. Uh, I can have the details about the data model of the user. And most of the time it's really close to the data model in database in smaller country, uh, smaller companies. If you have a big, uh, in, if you have a big, uh, infrastructure as uh, as the great previous talk displayed, maybe it won't be one one with your database model. But you learn a lot by digging into the data model of the graph of the application. So that was the first live demo of this talk. There will be a second one. And that's the first advice I can give to anyone who has GraphQL in production is remove the schema, remove the introspection because Knowing the schema is actually something that you can know, and I will show later how you can know the things about the schema without introspection. But at the same time, it makes the life easier for the hacker. And you don't want that. So in production, you don't want the schema. Um, when I hack into a REST API or any other kind of APIs, it takes me time to identify what are the valid inputs for each endpoint? In GraphQL, it saves me usually half a day on a complex application. So I remember that my uh, web security, uh, computer security class at university started with hacking a system is just a game of time and money. If you've got infinite time and infinite money, you will hack into any system. And the question is, as a defensor, how do you make it very expensive in terms of time and money for your attacker to break into your app? So make them laugh hard because they might give up and lose hope. The other thing is a bit more sneaky. So I was, I was attacking, pen testing this GraphQL application and I could not actually find the schema by introspection. Then I realized by browsing the front end website that in the graph, in the, in the, oof, in the React application, they were using this library named GraphQL tag. 
So I checked what it is on NPM. Don't forget, I'm a Node.js person. I speak NPM as my native language. And I found this library, which is basically a utils that helps you handle graph in the front end. And usually uh, people use that to handle pieces of graphs in the front end, pieces of the definition of the schema. So I see that this library is pretty popular. It has like 2 million weekly downloads, which is massive. And what I did is I went on a service that is named app.grep, a uh, grep.app that enables you to find basically grep anything on GitHub. And I identified a few hundreds of applications using this library. So I hacked a dirty script around it and I was able to dump the actual GraphQL schema of this application by accessing the code of their front end. And since it's front end code, it's something that runs into your client's browser or into your client's uh, mobile applications. So it's actually something you don't have any control and obscurity on. So that leads me to this other way to define, to find the schema of a GraphQL application, identify the client side code, and I use that to find what is the schema. So that breaks me to this hard truth. Your schema, or at least part of it, is public. That's something you need to accept. That's the web. And if you have developers who say they like security by obscurity, they are not security aware developer in my book. You still have to disable introspection because you want to make the hacker's life hard, but your schema is public, so anything in the information in that is public and there is no way you can keep that private for long. And the question is, okay, my schema is public, but why would a hacker use the schema to do anything? And that's where the hacker in me just goes into memeing into conference talks. So sorry about that, it's an old meme, but inject all the strings. And basically the internet is just a bunch of texts that gone wild and display things and the internet is about strings, meaning that a lot of things we do on the internet is about strings. And if you can inject arbitrary strings somewhere, you can find SQL injection, shell injections, evil injection, XSS, or any other kind of attacks that are string based. And even if the, in the case where you just have a GraphQL BFF uh, that queries other services, Maybe by having string going through your front, your first BFF, they will be spread to another unsafe API and you won't be protected. When you have an untrusted input getting into your app, you have to untrust it all the way to the database, to anything it can do. And at this point, the method to protect against these attacks are just the same that in any other protocol. You want to use a prepare statement in your databases. You want to sanitize data input as mentioned in the, uh, in the previous talk to avoid XSS. You want to uh, escape anything that is reflected to avoid, uh, to avoid ref reflective XSS. It's not because it's using GraphQL that there is no way you have a reflected XSS in a front end that does not sanitize the input it gets from the back end. So, Without further notice, let's go to the second live demo of this talk. And I hope this one will not fall apart either because for this one, I have less preparation. I mean, I don't have a pre-saved query. So let's remove all this garbage that I don't understand. And let's go back to a standard query for that one. So because I, have, I already know the schema, I know all the fields that I can use. Right now it's on the right hand side of my screen. So I will say that I want name, sorry, this is not quite cool, ID and disk usage. And why I selected the three ones is that because that's all the ones that are available. And as a hacker, I just want to see all the capabilities of the API. So I run this thing and I have identified here an input string thing. So I will start to play with it. 
And the person who wrote this API is a terrible person. That's me. Because here I see that when I start to play with the value with legitimate like thing, I have a, some kind of weird output in the error. Command failed. A, a shell command did not work. And if I had followed the uh, uh, the advice from the previous talk, I would have hidden my uh, error when something happens. But for the sake of making my demo easier, I expect terrible developer on the other side. I know this terrible developer, it's myself. So I see that there is something in my input that is used to run a command. So I look back at the API and I'm like, hey, yeah, there is something like disk usage. How does this API compute disk usage for a certain user? Probably by running a shell command to ask the OS about this usage. So here I've got user IDs. Okay, so let's try to tamper with that. Okay, we have got the same issues as previous one, but here I see that the command run is du for this for getting the disk size, and here I've got the full path, and here I've got my input. So let's be hacky and do something like ls slash. And here, I don't have any error. The code is running properly. And in this usage, I've got 100K. Then I've got things like, hey, I've got slash vdjcam, slash tmp, slash documents, slash applications. And I was actually able to ask the server to give me the value of the command ls slash. So in that example, I'm just reading. And in terms of risk management in security, we use three vectors. We name CIA, no link with the agency. It's confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And basically, when you have like what we call a shell injection, which is the attack I have now, everything is broken because I've got read rights with the user that is with the user rights that is user running the code i've got um rights rights with the same user and temporary uh, and with that i can break uh confidentiality i can read any piece of data i can break uh integrity i can modify any piece of data or integer availability i can just restart the server or shut it down so that's the vector you want to protect. And in that case, I've broken everything. Of course, if you've got, if you're not a terrible ops person, because I'm not only a terrible dev person, I'm also a terrible ops person, you run your code with an unprivileged user that cannot tamper too much with the host machine. Okay. So now that I have injected all the strings, next thing I do is I inject all the objects. And here you're like, wait, what? In GraphQL, you cannot object objects. And that's actually true. Uh, GraphQL by default is not object injectable, but there is the custom Scala tip that can be used where you can extend and create custom basic tip in GraphQL. And actually one of them is very popular according to NPM, it's the JSON one. And if you can inject arbitrary objects into a server, you can perform NoSQL injections. This talk is not about NoSQL injections, but you can check screen blogs or my previous talks on that topic. I have talked about that extensively for two years a while ago. And also I found a very fun use case when some ORM are actually using NoSQL-like uh, language to do query. So you can NoSQL-like SQL databases, but that just may be having some weird uh, fun with APIs. Before we finish, because we have two minutes to go, uh, a quick word about user management. Um, with GraphQL, I found out by auditing real life application that it is really easy to do mistakes. GraphQL, it's really tempting to do the thing that is the cleanest. No context aware code, just answering services and not caring about the context. And I disagree with that view. I think anything that is linked to user must be checked, especially the more abstraction you use, the more you need to check user everywhere. 
In the past, when you had multiple endpoints, you would check endpoints by user. Here, it's more complicated. Of course, you have directives. You have a lot of features. But at the end of the day, just make your code user aware. For each time you are tampering with data, check if the user has the endpoint rights. They are allowed to perform this operation, but also data-related rights. I am an admin. I have access to the list of users. I am a user. I have access to my own drafts. Am I allowed to read the draft of another user? Maybe. Am I allowed to edit them? Maybe not. So for each operation, make sure you know about the endpoint rights and the data-related rights. Quick, let's go to a conclusion because we are reaching the 20 minutes limit. Disable introspection was my first thing I want you to take out of this talk. Limit query depth to prevent TOS. I did not talk at all about that because it's one of the first advice you get in terms of security for GraphQL, but especially in the environment when the resource is limited, a very slow GraphQL query can link to a denial of service. If you use Node.js, it's single-threaded, so you are blocking all requests. If you are in a multi-threaded environment, you can make the server unresponsible and responsive with as many requests as you have uh, threads. And if you are in an elastic system, you can just hit when it's hard, I mean, the wallet, and make the, AP the owner of the API lose money. So limit query depth and first timeout, you will be happy. If you want to see some hacking about around uh, query depth and long responses, you can check my uh, last my talks from last year at the OWASP conferences. There's something that's really cool with GraphQL is that you know your schema. so. What I would recommend is you sit with your security person in your company and check the schema and everything that is sensitive, just ultra log everything and add more logs and be sure that you know what's happening. Highly trust custom scatters because that's where you are in the freestyle world. Without custom scatter, you are into the GraphQL by the book thing with custom scatter. Nobody can save you from eternal doom. And on that words, thanks so much for your attention. Let's keep in touch. I'm available on Twitter or by email. And I think we might have time to take a couple of questions. Jesse will tell us. So not not technically. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. um, but, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think actually everybody was just too blown away by the talk. So there wasn't anything posted. If you have any questions, ping them on Twitter, message them here in this platform. A fantastic talk. I just saw really thanks so much. I just saw a very quick question about the flag and my home yes. region flag. Take it. Uh, Take it's it. the flag of Alsace, which is this small region in the east of France that has been disputed between France and Germany. And at one point, we don't really know what we are, so I'm Alsatian before being from German or Swiss. So I'm pretty proud of that and I find the flag pretty cool. Uh, that was just a story for the background. Thanks so much for being an amazing crowd. <laughs> Fantastic talk, really excellent and a topic that everybody really needs to, uh, needs to consider.